going. Uh, so this talk is called Five E-Commerce Trends to Implement Now. Uh, Tracy Wallace is the editor-in-chief at Big Commerce and the founder and CEO of Dora Sleep and a content and SEO growth consultant for B2B and B2C brands. She has over 10 years of experience in retail and e-commerce space and on both uh, technology and customer facing side of things. Outside of Big Commerce, you can see her, her work on Mashable, uh, Refinery, 29L.com, Timeout New York, HubSpot, and more. Yeah, thanks though. So here's Tracy. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Just another second. It is coming, I think. Um, Cool, all right, well, I'll let that do that. Um, worst comes to worst, I'll do the uh, presentation without a presentation. Um, as was mentioned, I am Tracy Wallace. I'm the editor-in-chief over at Big Commerce, which mostly just means that I research, write, and analyze, um, or research and analyze, and then actually write uh, articles and thought leadership pieces on what the heck is happening in the e-commerce industry, why any of it matters, and why it's all like really hard. Um, I also uh, am the founder and CEO, as you heard, of my own e-commerce site. It's called Doris Sleep. I, I sell bed pillows. Um, I'm a co-owner in a manufacturing company that uh, manufactures pillows and cotton that my grandfather started back in 1956. Uh, so have been kind of deep in the manufacturing world uh, my entire life. It was my first job um, as a teenager pulling cotton through um, muggy East Texas summer machines. Um, other than that, um, I, I do also write uh, for a few newsletters, which um, I would love to mention to all of you now because I think they're really, really helpful to follow. So 2 p.m. Uh, is one of those. It's run by a man named Webb Smith. Uh, he talks a lot about what's happening in media as well as e-commerce uh, and direct-to-consumer brands in general. Lean Lux is another really good one. Um, I do think I'm going to have to do this without anything because the Wi-Fi is not working over there. Um, cool. So I know this presentation is five e-commerce trends, but I'm a little bit of an overachiever, so I actually have six e-commerce trends for all of y'all. Um, were we to have the slides, I was going to walk you through some data points. Um, we can send slides out to everybody afterwards, yes? Amazing. So I'm going to talk about the data points now, and then you can look at them afterwards. Um, in the fall of 2018, BigCommerce uh, did a uh, consumer study where we uh, interviewed and um, analyzed data from about 2,000 um, just regular Americans, and then another 2,000 folks in the UK, and another 2,000 folks over in Australia to find out how are people actually shopping online? And what we have found is that, by and large, as all of you are probably very, very well aware, um, people are shopping in the most omni-channel way possible. And I personally hate the word omni-channel um, because one, brands like uh, Big Commerce and a lot of technology companies use it a lot. Uh, the problem for retailers is that very few retailers um, necessarily have the tools or capabilities to do it incredibly well. Walmart is probably one of the only ones um, who's doing omnichannel decently well, but they have also spent millions and millions of dollars figuring out how to do uh, omnichannel really well. Oh. Hey, Topher. Yeah, please, that'd be great. Um, cool. Uh, that, that study ultimately also revealed, though, that not only are folks going to uh, Facebook to you know, hang out with their friends and then seeing your ad and then maybe over time remembering your brand and then also walking down a street and seeing your offline store because that's becoming more and more important. Um, they're also going to these websites and directly comparing your brand against Amazon right, um, or any other competitor out there. Uh, the goal for online retailers today uh, is ultimately to figure out a way uh, to convince people to buy from your site over Amazon's Site. Now, there are six things uh, that are kind of making this challenging, um, similar 
to this presentation. Uh, six things that are making this challenging. The number one uh, is, of course, that uh, cost of customer acquisition is rising. So if any of you in here have been doing uh, Facebook ads over the past maybe five years, you've probably noticed that as of 2018, Facebook ads have gotten a lot more expensive. Um, not only have they gotten a lot more expensive, actually figuring out a way to get um, customers from your Facebook ads has become ridiculous. Uh, before that, uh, if any of you are lucky enough to be in the group of folks who are advertising well before 2018 on Facebook, there are a lot of folks making a lot of money on Facebook ads very, very quickly. Um, as a result of the news around that, a lot of folks started investing in it and similar to Google PPC and really any acquisition channel these days, uh, it just became incredibly expensive because competition, there, there's a lot more competition there. That said, uh, Right now, what we see to be working the best for folks with um, any type of cost of or any type of customer acquisition is agencies, right? More and more folks are needing to hire agencies in order to lower their cost of customer acquisition or keep it honestly just pretty flat, right? We don't see too many brands investing additional amounts of money into Facebook advertising or into online advertising in general. Most folks are keeping it flat in general and trying to pull uh, that additional money that they might spend there into other channels and, and other resources. One of those being content and commerce, um, which I, I has, raise your hand if you've heard the term content and commerce. I like, oh, not everybody, okay. We're at a WordPress conference, you guys, content's important. Okay, um, so content and commerce uh, is becoming more and more important and that is because it is an earned channel. So what this means is, content or is building out content and an SEO channel to drive earned traffic to your website. Now that is not free traffic, right? Because um, you have to hire somebody or who knows how to do SEO incredibly well and there's certainly a salary there, but there is not the high cost of customer acquisition that there is on a lot of these advertising channels. So folks are beginning to invest in, and not even beginning to, this started happening last year, invest more and more in content and commerce um, strategies, right? Building out long form content, driving people to their website, trying to win at that top of funnel, get people's email addresses and push them through. Uh, what we are seeing though is that beyond that, there's a massive need for um, a user experience that, Oh, it's so close, I see it on there. <laughs> um, there's a massive need for a user experience that, okay. massive need for a user experience that will convince people to come to your site over Amazon, and beyond that, convince people to come to your site over your competitor sites. And one of the ways to do that, or one of the best ways to do that that uh, we are seeing right now is something called headless commerce. Anyone familiar with that, raise your hand. Amazing. Um, so what headless commerce is, uh, is the uh, decoupling of a presentation layer where you can use uh, tools like uh, WordPress or Drupal or, or any other CMS and couple that in with an e-commerce backend. Now what's annoying about e-commerce backends is that often, um, or what is annoying about e-commerce is that often you have to manage PCI compliance, there's a lot of fraud, inventory issues can um, make it a pain in the butt, which I, used to write about, but now also personally know. Um, CMS tools, though, are built the best, better than um, platforms like BigCommerce or Shopify, uh, for building out content and commerce, or really bu building out content campaigns and gr growing that earned traffic channel. We're so close, but we're not. OK, um, cool. <laughs> Awesome, so as a result of, um, of, of headless commerce, more and more, more and more folks are one, moving to SaaS models away from open source models and what used to be known in the e-commerce space as like more monolithic uh, e-commerce platforms, right? So um, those would be e-commerce platforms on which you would do just about everything. Instead, folks are tending to move to uh, what are known as microservice architecture platforms, reinvesting their money in front-end development to build massive, not massive, but really beautiful, interactive, engaging online experiences to capture consumer interest and brand loyalty uh, away from Amazon. This does not necessarily mean lowering your prices, right? It's building out a really great experience so that folks come and actually shop from you. Uh, 
What that means also, though, is that folks are pulling resources out of some of that back-end work in terms of integrating. Is this it? No. Mm. Can you mirror it, maybe? Hmm. Awesome, great. I'm just going to keep going. I have all this. It's just all in my head. Cool. Um, so. Uh, oh, 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 as a result, people are pulling um, their resources out of building in payment integrations or really focusing on PCI compliance. Who in here has like, dealt with PCI compliance and like, thinks it's a joyous activity? <laughs> Fantastic. Um, cool. I didn't think so. Uh, so people are pulling resources out of that and relying on a lot of SaaS tools to do that, right? Uh, instead, though, they are trying to build what are considered you know, the best I don't know, projects of your life, really trying to build crazy interactive, crazy, crazy cool online experiences. How many people in here work for an e-commerce agency? Fantastic. How many people in here use an e-commerce agency? OK. Um, I'll have to meet up with, with the other agency folks in here. But in the case that you are looking for some agencies who are doing some incredible work out there, now that does not mean go like hire these agencies, because I'm sure they are very expensive. Um, but they are building out really what is considered the like next generation of really fantastic e-commerce websites and e-commerce experiences. For instance, has anyone heard of Recess? It's a CBD drink that launched not too long ago. Now they have an offline store. Anyway, um, so th those are brands or agencies like Gin Lane or Wonder Sauce or Red Antler, which is based in Texas. That's where I'm from, which you would have seen on my bio. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I would very much encourage you guys to go check out what those folks are doing, what they are building out and really work with either your agencies or your developers or even with yourself to build out um, not necessarily similar things, but definitely be keeping up in terms of what those folks are doing. I get excited every time. Like There's like a small light that comes off. Anyway, cool. Other than that, though, so we've talked through one. Cost of customer acquisition is rising, so people are trying to pull not necessarily money out, but keep money pretty flat there, and instead reinvest that money in building out content and commerce opportunities and, and, and earned audiences, which is mostly through SEO. If anybody was in here earlier, there was a technical SEO section of this. Uh, when we have our question part a little bit later, I'd be happy to answer any questions there as well, uh, because SEO is an incredibly important part of that. Beyond that, though, it's not just about content and SEO. It's not about just getting people to your site. You actually have to have it be like a really pretty site. Um, you need to build out quizzes for them. You need to build out um, anything interactive. Whoa! It doesn't have a picture, though. OK, wait. This is what you will learn today. <laughs> um, OK, cool. Oh wait. oh, wait. I don't even think this is the, is this the right one. Yeah, it's not. Cool. Um, OK, so this is the stuff we're going to talk through. I'll have to show you all, all the data and stats a little bit later. But like I said before, paid media is going to need experts because cost of acquisition is rising. It's highly likely you're going to either need to hire an agency. We are no hire an agency or find an expert in the space. Two years ago, you could have gone and hired somebody right out of college and been like, yo, dude, go figure this out and make me a million bucks. And that was legitimately possible. Um, not as much anymore. Facebook is becoming more and more complex and costing a bunch. I personally accidentally spend, like, ac it's only happened once, um, <laughs> accidentally overspent on my Facebook ad campaign. And I'm considered an expert in this space. Spent 500 bucks and got nothing for it. Um, I would highly recommend you find experts. But don't invest all of your money and all of your resources there. Truly try to keep it as flat as possible. You want to make sure that your cost of customer acquisition is working for you. Instead, begin to reinvest and talk and, and think through content and commerce. We'll go here. Um, begin to invest in and think through content and commerce, uh, in which SEO is a big part. I'm going to fly through some of this because we've already talked about it. Cool. 
Headless commerce is becoming mainstream. Uh, again, headless commerce is really the ability to allow your teams to focus on building out a presentation layer that is like, wow, way better than Amazon, way better than some of your competitors, right? Allows you to build out quizzes, allows you to, um, you know, do like the cool interactive stuff in the background when people land there, whatever it is. Um, I honestly, the best thing in my point of view about headless commerce is that I can stand up here and talk about quizzes or like, it's called parallax, I think, right? Yeah, that, that stuff in the background. Um, but really the best thing about headless commerce is that it allows you to be as innovative as you can possibly be in terms of building out a presentation layer that's ultimately going to, one, represent your brand incredibly well, but also build a moat around your brand. A lot of people talk about building a moat around your brand in, ter in terms of offering, I don't know, free shipping. It's not a moat anymore. Amazon's conquered that. Or um, in pricing, right? Not so much of a moat anymore. What is a moat, what the data is showing can actually work, especially with millennials and Gen Z buyers, but more so with, with older generations as well, is actually providing a really cool online experience. And headless commerce is the best way to do it because CMSs have uh, the best tools uh, and the best platforms in order to do it. Of course. Online is not the only place where any of this matters. So uh, as I spoke about earlier, and if this is the presentation I remember, we'll have the data in a little bit to back it up. Um, but people are shopping in the most omni-channel way that they have ever shopped before. Uh, offline is a massive part of that experience. What you are beginning to see right now are brands like Shinola launch hotels. Has anyone been to Shinola Hotel? Great, me either. I really want to go. Um, but I hear that in the Shinola Hotel, not only do they have the watches in there, but also one of the big kind of points for Shinola, one of the reasons that you buy from them, is because they're all American made and not just American made, they're made in uh, Detroit. Yep, thank you, fantastic. Um, they're made in Detroit. So all, all items in their hotel, they're very, very proud of this, are made in America, vast majority of them in Detroit. It's something that, it, it's just part of that offline extension of their online brand. Uh, you also see brands like Sweetgreen throwing events, right? They aren't the only ones throwing events. Check out Recess, they just launched an offline experience. Um, I wish that like when I was making this, Recess had done that so I could show you images of it. Like I said, Recess is a like CBD drink, a new CBD drink, kind of like LaCroix, but CBD in it. Um, they launched an offline experience, not just for the individ individual drinks for people to come in and like hang, you know, drink, drink them, I guess. Um, but truly the entire place, I think they have masseuse in there. It's all about like chilling out, getting over your anxiety, right? And also it's like all neon, which looks really cool. Um, or you're gonna see a lot of people um, bringing malls back. Anybody in here like believe in malls? I, I do, I think they're coming back. It, they're gonna come back so hard. So there's one in Dallas called Neighborhood Goods uh, in which um, Neighborhood Goods is pulling in what are known as DNVB brands. That's digitally native vertical brands. It's like a big fancy word for like Casper or Warby Parker, right? So all, probably all the brands that like you really love and or admire, uh, but don't necessarily have physical presences, though I know Warby Parker does now. So Neighborhood Goods is pulling all of those in, and not only are they just pulling these brands in, like Me Undies or Andy Swim or all these brands that you could buy online but can't like touch in person, but they're also offering alcohol as you shop. They're doing events every night uh, for entrepreneurs or for college students or to help you like get back in the workforce, whatever it is, um, and they're killing it. They, they aren't the only ones doing this, by the way. This one's in, in Dallas, Texas. New York City has one. I believe there's one opening in Chicago. Um, I'm also pretty sure, like really hope, because I'm a like 90s kid and really want malls to come back, that all of the malls of the past really begin to look at this model and start doing very, very similar things. They have the square footage to do it. Um, so building offline experiences on top of your uh, online experience, your headless commerce experience, again, is your online one, but you need to build something offline. And all of you are probably thinking, holy heck, this is a lot of freaking work. How am I gonna make all of this happen? AI is how you're gonna make it all happen. So AI tools are becoming uh, better. I think it's the right word to use there. Uh, particularly in, in reference to chatbots. Um, so you can often 
with enough pre-planning build out decision trees for customer service that can ultimately map one, can answer people's most commonly asked questions, and then two, in the case they have a brand new question, can map people over to your, I don't know, phone so you can text them back or you can have a pretty holistic, um, I think Reamaze is a really good tool for like a holistic view of all of your customer service requests and you can just like go through and answer no matter where they actually submitted their request. Um, so tools like that are ultimately gonna help all of us uh, do all of this work better because as we know, there's no job shortage in the United States by any means. Um, it's, it, it's, it's hard to find extra people and also um, retailers are cash strapped. Cost of customer acquisition is high. It's not like we are doing all of these things for fun. We're doing them because we need to do them in order to win more customers. What's also really fun is that the retail workforce is changing. So for the first time ever, Four generations of human beings are in the workforce at the same time. Y'all, that's so cool. <laughs> and it's cool uh, because there are skills that uh, millennials, as, as like one of the, those four, don't have that other generations do have, in particular in regards to offline experiences. Um, anybody in here fly Southwest? Like, Southwest all the way, great. In December, they, their um, Southwest magazine, I think it was December, had, I um, can't remember the name of the man on the cover, but he used to work for Airbnb. He came out of retirement to go work for Airbnb, and back in um, the, I believe it was the 1960s or 70s, he had launched a line of boutique hotels all across the United States, most popular in LA and San Francisco, that were relatively inexpensive. And he got um, a bunch of celebrities to stay there, he got a bunch of regular folks to stay there, and was well known for all of his work. Went into retirement, was a generally happy guy until Airbnb called him up and was like, look, um, we know in order to compete with hotels, in order to compete with HomeAway, in order to compete in this industry that we have to do offline better and we can't find anybody who knows how to do that. Would you come work for us? Then he did. I think he went and worked like part-time for a year and then was there full-time for two years. Um, he now lives in like Baja, California and runs an entire center for people who are coming out of retirement to like go and help all of these people figure out how to do offline uh, uh, launches essentially. Um, but, that, but that is a huge area that we know is becoming more and more important. Millennials, which I guess are kind of the like one, they're talked about all the time. Uh, two, they're, I guess they're not the base of the workforce. I don't know what I'm trying to say. But uh, millennials are not incredibly great at offline experiences. They are good at cost of customer acquisition. Uh, they can be good at Facebook advertising. This kind of work, though, um, not something that, that is an inherent skill, but this is an inherent skill across a bunch of other generations. Gen Z is also going to be really, really good at, good at this. Data is showing that Gen Z likes to shop offline a whole lot more than they like to shop online. Um, I'm not Gen Z, but that's also true for me. Here's the data. Uh, cool. So as I mentioned before, the path to purchase is way more omni-channel than it ever has been. Um, so this is our kind of global study. So this combines uh, the US, the UK, and Australia all together. Um, but as you can see, uh, people are shopping across the board. Now, Snapchat and Instagram are, are pretty low over there. I don't know how like much Snapchat will necessarily grow. I do think Instagram's going to grow a whole lot. Keep in mind that a lot of Gen Zers are below 18 years old right now, and we can't like legally survey them. Um, so it was a pretty small survey sample for them. Um, but yeah, so Amazon's really huge. The second largest one is a physical store, and behind that uh, is the online store, where you'll see here in a second those that people are making considerations across the board. This is particular to Gen Z, uh, but it's a pretty similar story uh, for all of the generations in terms of what is actually influencing you to make a purchase, right? So you see something on social media, you try to price match it, you read a review somewhere, you see the brand on Amazon, which you're probably doing when you're trying to price match, and then maybe you go to the brand's website. Um, does anybody remember, like five years ago, Google put out this blog post about like micro moments or like micro touches. I don't see anybody, okay, a couple people nodding, <laughs> fantastic. Um, so that, that entire article was about the, the, the changing world and how Twitter can now be a point where somebody can like see a tweet and like then go buy from your store, right? And everyone's like, oh, this is monumentous. 
like they could never put something out like that right now. Like there is no clear path for absolutely anybody, right? People are one on their ad platforms or on Facebook is an ad platform, right? They're on Facebook all the time. Um, they're, they're, they understand Amazon incredibly well. Parents in particular shop more on Amazon than just about anybody else, especially parents of young children, likely because it's just easier, right? You can go there and you can purchase all of your items at once. Um, and then you see millennials and younger folks as well as um, older generations, ones older than um, that young parenting age buying uh, on branded websites. What's super interesting though, is that the top reasons why people prefer to shop on Amazon versus why they buy in store aren't all that different, right? So convenience, prices, ease of shipping are why people like to shop on Amazon. Uh, convenience and speed, couple of reasons why people like to shop in store, and then why are consumers buying online its brand reputation and its loyalty and rewards programs. Brand reputation goes back to that headless commerce point, right? It's not just about people hearing about you. It's not just about having a great social media presence or whatever it is. It's also about really impressing people when they come to your website so that they remember you. I mean, just think about how often you guys are going to websites all the time I mean, I have to take like screenshots of stuff that I like in order to remember to go back, and then that hardly even happens, um, except for recess. Clearly, I remember that one. Their, their website's really good. Um, yeah, and then also the ability to try items on in stores, 3x more influential than other in-store purchase considerations. I, I've been working in e-commerce for 10 years, y'all, and I still prefer to shop in store. Anybody else prefer to shop in store? Yeah, it's easier. I, I like to go to Dillard's. There's no lines there. Payment options matter. Um, so these numbers over here are what um, our survey respondents said that they are will the most. Our survey respondents said that they are willing to pay uh, for an online item. You see, the United States is a little bit higher. If you're selling products over this price point, you are 100% going to need some financing options to help convince people to buy items from you, right? So you can think of that uh, in terms of furniture. Some mattresses, I think. Um, appliances, appliance parts. Uh, so definitely uh, consider financing, uh, which is becoming more and more popular. Also, there's a lot of financing tools out there that will pay you the full price, and then they just take on the actual like job of following up with people. Cool. Now, this one's really fun. Um, everyone's like aware of what's going on in the media industry, right? BuzzFeed just laid off a bunch of folks. Um, who else? HuffPo. Um, it's not a pretty world over there by any means, nor has it been for a while. Anybody in here read The Statuary? It's another one everyone should definitely go read. Anyway, they, uh, they published a really great post not too long ago when the BuzzFeed layoffs happened, essentially saying that what is happening in the media industry, what, what the biggest problem is, uh, is not that they're necessarily publishing like, you know, the listicles or bogus headlines or fake news or what, whatever. It's more so that they no longer own their data. Years ago, it was advertisers would go to a publisher because that publisher had all rights to an audience and a pretty targeted audience. You wanted to advertise in Vogue, you knew exactly what type of consumer you were going to be in front of. It's no longer the case, right? Uh, Facebook and Google have a lot better targeting for a lot cheaper. Why would you ever go to the publishers, right? What they have is a problem about owning their own data because Facebook and Google own and Amazon, and Walmart kind of, um, own all of the data or a lot of it. Uh, so it is incredibly important that your brand begin to build out ways to attract, to, to get your own first party data. This isn't just about the data about folks coming to your website, it is also about building email lists uh, and then making sure that you were being um, you know, honest and forthright with that data. Now, there are some challenges, right? You have GDPR over in the UK, I think California just passed something not too long ago. What's real fun over here is that seven out of 10 consumers say they would opt out of giving retailers their data if they could, but over in the UK where they can actually do that, only 23% have done so. Um, so consumers are not, it, I guess the burden falls on them at that point in time. Uh, also, we broke it down over here in terms of what actually encourages people to actually share their data. For Gen Z, it's free shipping, millennials, product discounts, Gen X, product discounts, and for baby boomers and seniors, um, figure out something, I don't know. 
Cool. I talked about this uh, a little bit earlier in terms of just like the history of e-commerce in terms of technology. Uh, the technology and the tech stack that you use are really, really important because one, some of them can be really expensive. And if you're paying a lot for customer for cost of uh, customer acquisition, you need them to be not as expensive. Two, it's important because you want to build out really, really great uh, online experiences. And not every, every platform is going to let you do that, right? Um, like I mentioned before, CMS systems like WordPress are actually the best place to build them. Uh, so you're ultimately going to want to ideally use one of those as a front end and then use something e-commerce on the back end so that you don't have to manage PCI compliance, because nobody in here likes it, because you're all sane. Um, cool. So historically, monoliths were the best way to go. They were pretty much the only way to go. Uh, and then you saw brands like you know, BigCommerce, Shopify, folks like that become, be beginning to come into the market. That's when you started to have a core commerce uh, product where it would like ERPs and CRMs and even CMSs beginning to plug in. And what you're seeing now is more of a headless commerce um, move, right, where you are using APIs and microservice architecture to ultimately uh, drive people uh, not just to your site, but to connect your entire e-commerce ecosystem. What this system allows you to do is if you don't like some part of your website, you can just unplug it and plug something else in, right? So like, I think the best way headless commerce has been explained to me uh, was if you were driving a car and you get a flat tire, on one of these, on the core commerce or the, or the monolith side, you have to replace literally the entire car to fix the tire. On headless commerce, you can just go, you can just go fix the tire. Like it's, it's not a big deal. You just, just go do it. A few other things that uh, headless commerce allows you to do, build out content-driven websites, uh, experience-driven websites. It also allows you to go multi, uh, to do multi-store or uh, launch internationally really, really easily. I got 10 minutes, so we're, and I'm almost done. <laughs> Cool. So a couple of use cases. Um, I will send out the updated deck to you guys after this, because I updated this with the New York Times. Um, the New York Times is doing content and commerce incredibly well. You guys go look at their merchandise store. Um, and then also like just go hang out on their site, and they're going to end up retargeting you back to their merchandise store. Uh, the Daily Dot is another good example, though, um, using content as a way to get people into your commerce funnel. Um, without commerce actually getting in the way, right? So you can focus your core business on publishing high quality content, then retarget folks back or link over to a merchandise section where it makes sense. Experience driven. Uh, so anyone in here like Jenny's ice cream? Yeah, it's real good, y'all. Also, uh, I don't know if y'all know, but you can buy, uh, like in the middle of the Texas summer, I'm from Texas, you can buy a like box of Jenny's ice cream and it will ship to you in August when it's 110 degrees in Austin in dry ice. It's real cool. Anyway, you should do it. Um, clearly, based on their shipping uh, experience, Jenny's is an experience-driven brand. You land on their website. This is a still screenshot. But on their website, all of those little like spoons are changing different flavors. Like Everything's moving. It is a cool experience. They are using headless commerce to build and drive. So they're using WordPress as, as their front end um, to drive a really cool experience that people get excited about and also really makes you want Jenny's ice cream. Uh, Dolce & Gabbana is another really great brand following a very similar strategy. Now, on their end, clearly that's more of a luxury model, but uh, all of the different textures and the photos really trying to, to you know, impress you. Uh, over on the B2B side, you see folks doing the same thing. This one up here is GE. Again, this is a still screenshot, but uh, if you were to go to that website, this entire thing moves. It starts out with a train like coming at you, and then it turns, and like the whole thing kind of like comes off. They're using WordPress on the front end to make that happen, and then using an e-commerce system on the back end to um, actually allow you to check out uh, while managing fraud, PCI compliance, all of that fun jazz. Also, headless commerce and your e-commerce technology in general needs to be um, able to scale with you, right? Like, best case scenario, you grow like crazy. Uh, and the last thing you want is to be stuck on a platform that just doesn't make sense for you. Uh, so you see BarkBox and Cal Calix Flowers here, both really great examples of using WordPress as a front end and an e-commerce platform as a back end. This is how you know it was not the, the ready presentation. 
Anyway, um, so recap here uh, real quick because I only have a few extra minutes and then I do want to allow y'all to ask questions. Recap though is um, one, you are not alone in feeling like cost of customer acquisition is rising and like Facebook advertising isn't working as well for you anymore. It is not. What you should do is begin focusing more on content and SEO, which means you need to be focusing on backlinking, building out really cool content, adding in quizzes, right? At this point in time, I'm already beginning to talk about UX on your website. So begin thinking about how you can use your WordPress front end to build out a crazy cool website that your competitors cannot easily replicate and that's gonna give people a reason to come shop from your brand. That's it. How much time we have for questions? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Any questions? Yes. Nathan? Yeah. Um, so let's say you have a brand that has been putting a lot of effort into content for a long time, but um, is still interested in like maximizing their efforts in ad platforms. Yes. Are there still some that you would recommend? In ad platforms? I mean, Facebook. Well, yeah. Like, are you retargeting folks who are landing on your content? Yeah. Awesome. So like, as Facebook becomes, you know, like, let's say we're optimizing Facebook as best as we can. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, Facebook and Google are the only two that I have a bunch of experience in um, or, or know decently well. I'm going to like shift your question a little bit outside of, of paying for ad costs. What I see working really well in that case is partnerships. Folks using partnerships to, one, get a bunch of backlinks, but also using um, organic posts on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram to drive folks to those content pieces again with a larger audience, right? So if you already have your content built out, you can like, you know, that's BAU, right? It's just like humming along. Now go out and find yourself some partners who are not competitive to you, but complementary to you, and start building out a partnership program that can push more and more people over to that organ or over to the, those pages. Okay. Yep. Yes. Kind of like the mall in Texas. Are you guys selling stuff online, or, or you just want to get people to like register online and come in? Exactly. We want okay. them to see our content, register, and then come into the physical space. Awesome. So, what? Oh, yes, I can repeat the question. Sorry, everybody. Uh, the question is, we have a co-working space. We need, uh, we need or want to drive more folks online to that space to sign up and register for it and then actually come in, similar to what that mall's doing. Um, what that mall has begun doing is publishing a bunch of content, um, interviews with those founders. For you guys, what I would focus on is publishing content around... Um, not necessarily co-working, but like business best, best practices, right? How to actually um, be, be effective and productive uh, and then beginning to work with, there's a bunch of publishers out there who publish very similar content to this. You can start working with a lot of them in terms of um, affiliate relationships to push a bunch of traffic back over to you. Is that helpful? Yeah, okay. thank you. Cool, yes. Can you talk about voice, how voice interaction is becoming new and maybe in this industry uh, some, some, some things you guys are seeing in this space for voice? Sure. Um, so I don't know a whole lot about voice. I also haven't seen it be incredibly popular or something that's incredibly used yet. The couple things that I do know is that um, separate from kind of how people search on Google, which tends to be kind of shorter keywords, people on voice are like literally giving you sentences. They are like, I need roses for uh, my boyfriend for Valentine's Day, and I don't want them to be red and maybe white and maybe like, right, like they're long, right? Um, so a lot of folks are seeing a lot of success with, or not a lot, some success with voice commerce because it's still relatively new um, with, the, with the longer tail keyword searches, right? Which is great and helpful because that often means the folks who are often ranking for the longer tail searches um, aren't the like big Nordstrom brands of the world, right? They're, they're the smaller guys. Um, also though, keep in mind the brands who own voice commerce um, have their own e-commerce stores, Amazon in particular, and they are gonna put their products ahead of, ahead of that. Yes.
Can you give me an example? Yeah, when you, uh, you give an information in a survey, for example, and this is site was picked up on your geographic location, because of cross reference or something else, and now they're talking to you like they know you. Right. Right, 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 and that's, that's where you see GDPR and some of the, the laws in California beginning to come in. You know what's interesting? Um, I read an article the other day, and somebody in here might know a little bit more than me on this, um, but that Facebook's pixel is on something like, like 500,000 websites. Like They are literally following, following you absolutely everywhere you go on the web. Even my site. I like just launched my site like not long ago. But because I'm connected to Facebook Shop, there's a Facebook pixel over on my website. So when someone goes to Facebook and then comes to my site, Facebook's gathering that data, right? Um, there is a lot of concern about that. I don't know if I can talk in particular about the, about the pushback or what's going to happen. I think what is really important, and it goes back to that own your data slide, is you need to build a personal relationship with your own customers. You need to get their email addresses. You need to um, talk to them effectively, right? Um, in, in order, one, that means you need to make sure that your email open rates are high, that you are of interest to them. Um, I also found out the other day, y'all might know this as well, that if you put on Facebook or Instagram, like reply in the comments, Facebook and Instagram are gonna start like dinging you so that your posts don't show up as often. Apparently, they put that into uh, the terms of service uh, this time last year, which is just great to know. I, that wasn't helpful. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yes. You're seeing tools where uh, you go onto a site and you may see, hey, so-and-so purchased this yes. hours ago or six hours ago. What are you seeing in, that, in this industry when, when people use tools like that? Yeah, yeah. How many people in here have studied psychology or know, know too much about psychology? Yeah, a few people, great. Most marketers should. Um, that is a, a psychological tool, right? Um, I doubt those people have actually purchased those things when they've said that you've done it. Yeah, um, instead, it's, it's a FOMO tool, right? It's, oh, somebody bought this. Oh, it's almost out. Oh, this is discounted. Um, Y'all, that stuff works. Like, if you can, yeah, yeah, it's social proof. It's, it's um, reinforcing to people that, that the money that they're spending is worth spending. Um, it works. There are a bunch of tools and apps out there that, that do it. Um, I don't know how long those things will continue to go on, but, but it is part of just a psychological trigger within all of our brains that make us think, oh, somebody else bought that crap. I better do it too before they're out. Okay. One minute. One last question, if there is one. What's the biggest challenge? Oh, no, wait. Say again? Oh, OK. Sorry. What's the biggest problem you faced this year? With my own store? Yeah. Driving traffic. Um, so I, I am a content marketer by trade um, and, and have been doing that for a really long time, particularly for the e-commerce industry. And I'm, like everybody else, needing to figure out how to drive additional traffic, how to make sure that my technical SEO is as fantastic as it can be. I had a long conversation about schema the other day, and I was like, shh. I don't know enough about schema. Um, so I need to start implementing that kind of stuff. So for me, it's publishing more content uh, to drive more top of funnel traffic. But at that point in time, as soon as I start doing that, I'm going to need to push those people down into the middle of the funnel and the bottom of the funnel, which hopefully when I'm driving more traffic, I can deal with those problems. Retention right now is also a, a really big issue, which goes back to um, owning your own data. Uh, there are some new tools out there like uh, Retention, Rocket, um, there's smile.o, there's, the, there's a few of them out there that, that are helping with retention in terms of, okay, now that I have your information, how do I engage with you in a way that doesn't seem intrusive, but also like gets you to pay attention. So Retention Rocket, for instance, captures um, email SMS at checkout, so that when packages start to ship, you're like text messaging them that, that the packages have shipped, um, and then after that, folks seem to like when you let them know that you've like released new products, right? Um, how long will that be effective? Who knows? But it's effective now. OK. Cool. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for dealing, like, hanging on.